good old air, hey? God's own gas. It's the easiest gas to prepare, and it's the lovely gas to dive on. Or is it? Let's talk about it. G'day, thanks again for joining me in the dive shed. There's something very nice about just filling up your tank with air and going for a dive. No mucking around with oxygen blending, helium, boosters, all that malarkey that takes so long, and it's not without some problems and hazards as well. So why don't we just use air for all our dives? So in this talk, we're gonna talk about air and go back to some basic principles, just as a bit of a refresher. For those of you who are still uh, on your technical diving journey, still learning about this stuff, or for those of you who have forgotten some of the reasons that we have to take certain precautions um, with the types of gas that we dive. The thing is to choose the right gas for the depth of dive and the type of dive that you're doing. So we're going to have to talk about oxygen, nitrogen, helium of course, uh, carbon dioxide, and maybe even touch on hydrogen in the last talk of the series. This will mostly be a very common sense practical approach to uh, talking about different gases with just a touch of science as a refresher. And I've got, the, I've got the whiteboard there just in case we need it. So let's have a look. The first uh, couple of very basic principles we just need to remember is that of uh, ambient pressure and the partial pressures of different gases. Now don't worry, this won't take long and it should be quite painless. So we're sitting here at one atmosphere at the surface and I'm breathing air of course, which is roughly 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Now that gives us a partial pressure of those two gases of 0.79 nitrogen and 0.21 for oxygen because we're at one uh, atmosphere and those are the fractional amounts of those gases within air. Now for every 10 meters that we descend, we're going to add another atmosphere of pressure. And in diving, it's actually easier to talk about atmospheres absolute. So we don't forget about the, the surface pressure that we're sitting in right here, of one atmosphere. So for the extra 10 meters as we descend, we're going to add a second atmosphere and at 10 meters, therefore, we'll be at two atmospheres absolute. Apologies again to anyone who doesn't work in metric, but it's far simpler, I can assure you, when you're talking about all this different stuff. So our air, which we're breathing at the surface, now we are breathing at two atmospheres absolute and all we need to do to, to work out the partial pressures of the component gases is to double them from one to two. So the oxygen will go from a partial pressure of 0.21 up to 0.42 and the nitrogen will go from roughly 0.79 up to roughly 1.6. Now why do we need to worry about partial pressures? Well, it's the partial pressure of these gases that actually has the physiological effects, both the good effects and the adverse effects. Uh, the percentage of the gas actually doesn't really matter. I know we're breathing 21% oxygen, but that's not what's keeping us alive. It's the partial pressure of oxygen in my brain that's keeping me conscious and hopefully coherent for this talk. So if I made a strange decision and filled up a tank with 5% oxygen and 95% uh, nitrogen, and started breathing off it, within 60 seconds I would be unconscious and if the regulator stayed in my mouth, I'd very rapidly be dead. The reason I chose a strange gas like that to illustrate the point though, is that if I took that gas down to 40 meters, it then would become safe to breathe from the oxygen point of view. And at 40 meters, we're breathing an extra four atmospheres of pressure compared to here at the surface. So we've got the one for the surface, four for the 40 meters makes a total of five atmospheres absolute. So the partial pressure of oxygen at 40 meters would be five times 0.21, which is 1.05. Still within our safe range of uh, oxygen partial pressures. And we'll talk about what the high end of that range is shortly. Um, and suddenly that gas becomes compatible with life. Now, unfortunately the nitrogen at those pressures would cause us another problem, which we'll discuss in, the mo in a moment, and that is nitrogen narcosis. And also the air would be very, very thick to breathe at that uh, depth because of the thickness or density of the nitrogen. Every dive and the choice of gases is always a balancing act, in fact. Um, pros on the one side, cons on the others. You don't get anything for free in technical diving. So we can consider for oxygen, the safe range of breathing is roughly between 0.2, what we're breathing in air here at the surface, up to a range of 1.6, which is the equivalent, if you think about it, of breathing 100% oxygen at six meters, 
since six meters is 0.6 of one extra atmosphere. So it gives us 1.6. So let's have a little talk about inert gases. Uh, and nitrogen is a classic example of one of those. Uh, xenon, argon, helium are other examples that you might come across uh, when diving is being discussed. An inert gas essentially means that it doesn't undergo any chemical reactions within the body. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't mean it won't undergo or cause any physiological issues within the body. And we've just discussed the issue of nitrogen, uh, which is nitrogen narcosis, which is a physiological effect on the brain due to the lipid solubility of nitrogen in the fatty tissues. In simple terms, what happens is the nitrogen probably gets into the cell membranes and changes their shape or size slightly, such that the cell membrane function is disrupted. And so in the same way that you get affected by alcohol or other sedative or anesthetic drugs, you start to uh, become disinhibited, perhaps less relaxed uh, than you should or more relaxed than you should. Um, and if you keep going deeper and deeper and those issues keep uh, developing, then essentially you'll become anesthetized and lose consciousness. Obviously in the operating theater, not an issue. Underwater, a very, very bad idea indeed. So the practical issues of inert gases, and let's start with nitrogen since we're talking about air, are twofold. Nitrogen narcosis, which we've mentioned briefly, and decompression sickness. So let's have a quick chat about DCS or decompression sickness just to understand why it's the nitrogen that's causing the problem, not the oxygen in the air that we're breathing. Oxygen just gets metabolized. If we could breathe 100% oxygen for all our dives, we wouldn't even have to think or consider uh, about uh, decompression sickness. But oxygen, as we'll talk about, has its own issues, and we've already alluded to that maximum partial pressure of oxygen, which is safe to breathe, of 1.6. Now, the nitrogen that we are breathing here at the surface, 79%, uh, or a P nitrogen, or PN2 of 0.79, my body is completely saturated with 79% nitrogen as we are speaking. Now, if I suddenly drop down to 10 meters, add another atmosphere of pressure to that, then the P nitrogen that I'm inhaling at that depth is now double. That means there's a gradient from the pressure um, in the regulator that I'm breathing, in through the lungs, into the bloodstream, down to the tissues, which are still at that uh, lower nitrogen partial pressure from the surface. And so my tissues are going to start to absorb nitrogen, take it up until the, uh, the tissue partial pressure of nitrogen level equilibrates with the ambient temperature, uh, ambient pressure, the pressure at 10 meters depth. Now that will take actually days to occur, especially in the slower tissues in your body, which are either poorly uh, supplied by blood or don't have much fat in them so that the, the nitrogen takes a long time to be stored and, and taken up into those tissues. But a fair bit of nitrogen can, can get into your tissues pretty quickly, especially into the so-called fast tissues like your muscle and bloodstream and so forth. So it doesn't take long before there's enough nitrogen in those tissues for you to have to take into consideration when you return to the surface. If we, after a, a, a long dive, um, then suddenly pop back to the surface, then all that extra nitrogen that, that is now stored in your tissues has to come back out the same way it went in. So it comes out of the tissues, into the venous bloodstream, and back to the lungs where it can be safely exhaled in most instances. Now, if we come up too fast, instead of just coming out of solution and back in, out of the tissues and back into the, the bloodstream, it will actually come out of solution and form bubbles. And it's those bubbles that we believe cause the disease state of decompression sickness. Now, the presence of bubbles is not necessarily a problem because the lung is very effective at removing them as they come out of the tissues back through the veins into the lungs. But if they start to form uh, very uh, fast or aggressively in different tissues, things like the spinal cord, those tissues can actually, uh, those bubbles can actually mechanically disrupt those tissues and cause damage. Or if sufficient uh, numbers or, or size of bubbles come back through the veins into the lungs, it can start to obstruct the blood vessels in the lungs and cause respiratory uh, or cardiac problems, or sometimes they can find a bypass around the lungs and end up in the arterial circulation. And many of you will be familiar with patent foramen ovale or PFOs, uh, which is one example of that kind of shunt around the lungs. So we need to be aware of how deep 
we're diving, how long we've spent there, and of course we use tables or computers to guide us back to the surface in the appropriate, at the appropriate speed to avoid decompression sickness. So another reason why we can't use our um, 5% oxygen and 95% um, nitrogen because that will greatly add to our decompression requirements. It'll take a long time to have to come back to the surface or mean we can only spend a very short time down at depth. So in the next talk, we're gonna talk about nitrox and uh, already hopefully you've got some um, you know, reason to understand why getting rid of some of the nitrogen and replacing it with oxygen may be beneficial from the point of view of decompression sickness and maybe also from the point of view of nitrogen narcosis. But like I said before, you don't get anything for nothing. So it's, all, it's also got its own risks and problems. We'll see you soon. Thanks for joining me.